to the monthly webinar series from the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. My name is Allison Avisekara. I am the Director of Training and Technical Assistance here at ACU. So happy to have you with us here today for this very exciting topic. Um, ACU is one of a network of national cooperative agreements that receives funding from HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care to support health centers, PCAs, and other organizations in the safety net um, do the very important work that you do. So uh, we're an NCA focused on offering resources, training, and technical assistance, all for free, mind you, around clinician recruitment and retention issues at your health center. You can get information on all of, the, all of the work that we do on our website, so please check it out and give us a call if you have questions or want to know how to access some things. Um, there are recordings of previous webinars, and I do want to note that today's session will be recorded and available after the fact if you want to go back and learn more or check out those slides again. You can download a copy of the slides and some other information on the um, bottom right of your little go-to webinar uh, box, you should see a little box that says handouts. You can click that and download the PDF of today's presentation. But again, it will be available online. If you do have any technical problems accessing those handouts or hearing anything or doing anything today, please just give us a chat um, to the ACU staffer. You'll see that in your chat box. You can write to um, our our staffer, Mariah, she will help you out. Um, and in general, you can email us um, if you have any questions or concerns throughout. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it out to our very exciting and capable and talented presenter, Dick Finnegan. Thank you, Allison, very much. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our program. And I'm speaking to you today from my hometown, which is Orlando, Florida. And I'm actually downtown in a church where we record videos in a studio. So I'm taking a break from doing that. So if you hear urban sounds, buses, sirens, whatever, I'm sorry in advance should you hear them. But I hope that doesn't become an obstacle. So uh, let me tell you, first of all, some things about me. And uh, I am, as the slide says, a recovering HR director. Uh, meaning that I was once an HR executive of a big company, and I then started this company to cut employee turnover and have worked all over, have worked with Siberia, literally banks across Siberia. I've been three kilometers deep in gold mines. I've worked in Shanghai and Beijing with multinational corporations there, and I really have been commissioned by the CIA to cut CIA turnover. And along the way, I got asked to write some books. So I wrote that book to the upper left, Rethinking Retention, uh, which Business Week liked and said nice things about. The book to the right from there, The Power of Standard Reviews, is the top-selling book in history for the Society for Human Resources Management, or SHRM. And then came bottom left, The Stay Interview, and then bottom right, this book called HR's Greatest Challenge. So what our company does is cut employee turnover, big companies, small companies, a lot of healthcare companies, and also improve employee engagement. And we do it with specific approaches, specific tools based on these books. And here's the key phrase. It's not by a book. The key phrase is business driven. So what I'm going to show you today is a business driven way to cut employee turnover, which I know for all of you is really important. So I'm going to start by defining this idea of standard views. We're going to morph into some data and data about trust. We're going to talk more about standard views and how to do them, and we're going to have a short, fun quiz at the end. So I'm checking my watch at Eastern Time, 2.04, so we have 56 minutes left, and I'm going to do the best I can to make it interesting and exciting and helpful and productive for you. So I would like to start here. The official drum roll definition of a standard view is a structured discussion a leader conducts with each individual employee to learn specific actions she, the leader, must take to strengthen that employee's engagement or retention with the organization. There are two key words here. Structured, which means I'm going to show you five questions. They're the only ones you need. And leader, meaning it's got to be the first line leader. It can't be a skip level leader two levels up. It cannot be HR, because the primary reason to do standard interviews is to build trust with the supervisor. The second reason is to get data to solve issues. 
but first is to build trust. So why do these things work? How can something so simple work like this when we have all these engagement surveys and exit surveys and all these things, which I will show you, don't work? And the reason is because they're always current, that when you have a conversation with the structure that I'm going to teach you to do, it opens the door to future conversations. So it's not a survey that's gathering dust on the shelf. It's always current. It's focused one-on-one. -on -one. There's no anonymity. This is not a survey where you can hide behind a number. You're a real person talking to another real person who's your manager. And top performers perform four or five times the work the average employee does. We've got to be able to identify them and make sure we keep them, whereas a survey buries their data. We don't know who they are. And thirdly, it puts managers in a solution seat they are the most important people or you are the most important people because you've got to build trust. So as I say all this, let me show you the dire straits we're in. That our government tells us that voluntary quits keep rocketing up. They're about to release the 2015 data. And why is this? Well, in part because young workers change so much. Now, you have three things working in your case to your disfavor. One is there's too many jobs. That's the way it is. We wouldn't have said that in 2008, right? But in 2016, there's too many jobs. Secondly, young workers change so much. And notice it says over here, young US workers hold jobs 10 to 14 by age 38. Age 38 is not young. It's not young. It's gulp of middle age. So they're changing jobs deeper into their lives. And third, for STEM jobs or healthcare jobs, there just aren't enough people to fill them. We don't have enough people to fill them. So three things work to our disfavor on turnover when we're in healthcare. Now, so you know in our company, we work with clients to report turnover in dollars. So imagine if you knew that losing a physician cost 225808, would that make your management team more determined to cut turnover? We find the answer is yes. So uh, I'll tell you later on how to get some free tools and one will be how to put dollar values on turnover and dollar values on engagement, because we've invented ways to do both of those things. Here is the data that is mind-blowing. And as much as we talk about turnover, let's talk about employee engagement instead, which essentially means do people give their best. Now, Gallup has told us that from 2000 to 2014, the percent of employees who do their best hasn't changed at all. Here it is. The green is the engaged. These people do not change. The middle group, which is the biggest group, is not engaged, not kind of engaged, not sort of engaged. They are not engaged. Or as Gallup says, they are, here's the key word, sleepwalking. And this group in the orange that's actively disengaged is, according to Gallup, sabotaging. They are taking away from the productivity of everybody else. So let's look at three key pieces of data here. One, nothing changes. So what have we had since 2000? We've had 9-11. We've had terrible economies. We've had really good economies, great economies, bad economies, terrible economies coming out of it, now good economies. We've had war and peace. We've had Republicans and Democrats. We've had every outside influence we could have, but nothing changes how little our employees are engaged. Secondly, the best year here is 2014 to 31, which means two-thirds of our employees in the best year are sleepwalking or sabotaging. And third, person by Deloitte says we spend this much money, it's hard for me to say it out loud, 1.53 billion a year improving, in quotes, engagement, which we don't do. And where does the money go? I don't know, but here's my guess. Engagement surveys, exit surveys, more engagement surveys, more exit surveys. We think surveys will give us answers, but they don't. They just give us data. So we have not figured out how to slow turnover, according to here. We have no clue. And we are wasting a ton of money trying to solve engagement because we can't figure it out either. And to take it one step further, just so you know, Engagement is worth a lot of money. Look at all these different 
respected organizations gallop 22% more profitability the more people you have in the green, not orange to middle, middle to high. Great Place Work Institute, 20% more productivity. Hewitt engagement correlates with higher shareholder returns, double shareholder returns, 26% more revenue per employee. So this idea of engagement is really important. And as I said earlier, we'll help you put a dollar cost on that too, if you'd like. So let's now move and ask a big question. This is a big drum roll question. And the question is, in your organization, are your retention efforts driven by accountabilities or programs? So what does that mean? Well, accountabilities means that's how you really get things done, right? So if you take the most important metrics in your organization, and those could be patient-related metrics, those could be quality-related metrics, those could be volume-related metrics, that the CEO has numerical goals to achieve, so does the EVP if you have that title, so does the VP. Everybody who manages has numerical goals to achieve. And there are reports every month, every week, every day with these managers or their department's names on them with goals to achieve. That's how Peter Drucker taught us management works. That's how it works on all six inhabited continents. And that's the way things have to work. The flip side is, though, do you solve retention with programs? So do you get survey results, like exit surveys, for example, where employees say, no, you know, I just want more recognition. That's why I'm leaving. So you say, okay, we have to fix that. Let's have Employee of the Month and Employee Appreciation Week. Or employees say they want more communications. Okay, we can fix that. Let's have town hall meetings and newsletters. Employees want career coaching. We'll bring in a guest speaker from the community college. Those are programs. So big difference, right? You solve retention with accountabilities or programs. And you can see it says down here 86% of the time from one study that it's programs. But we have a poll for you. We're going to ask you to tell us which side would you choose. The left side on my previous slide, which is accountabilities, are the reports with managers' names against turnover goals, or is it programs? And sometimes we would call that HR go fix it. So one side or the other, please. Please make a choice. Okay, do we have a response? There you go. Okay, so the answer comes out 53 to 47, which in percentages, which is high, which if there's really accountabilities for your managers on retention, you're off to a really good start. And accountabilities means performance against goals. It doesn't mean a performance review form that has a box for, let's say, talent management, uh, but it means real accountabilities. So that's a good start. So let's move forward now and talk about why this matters so much. So we have five lines from five separate studies on the slide, and they're all about the same thing, that how long people stay in your company and how hard they work is directly related to their relationship with their immediate supervisor. It's not about programs. So we start with, if you have a turnover problem, says Gallup, look first your managers. Then we say, why do people stay? Managers first, coworkers second. Nothing about pay benefits or anything directly contributed by HR. Employees' levels of engagement go up when their supervisors goes up, but down when their supervisors goes down. When employees stay, it's because they're immediate managers. That's about teachers. Who would have thought principals drive how long teachers stay, but they do? Then a slight twist at the bottom. Employees who stay primarily for their supervisors. So if I reported Allison to you, and of course I would like to report to you, and you are the reason I stay, then I stay longer, which improves retention. I perform better, which improves engagement. But I'm also more satisfied with my pay. Now, let's take that idea further, because Conexa, a global consulting firm, interviewed 1,000 people who recently quit and asked five questions. How did you like your pay, benefits, development, advancement, and relationship with your supervisor, and got the straight flush? The more you like your boss, 
the more you liked your pay benefits development and advancement. But if you didn't like your boss, guess what? You didn't like your pay benefits development or advancement. And Connexa went on to say at the end of the study, and you can see it on your slide, offering a higher salary for developmental or advancement opportunity may not be enough to retain employees, which is code for that's not why they leave, right? That's not really why they leave. It's more about giving them a supervisor who, as I will show you soon, is a person who they trust. So the picture is getting clear now that stay interviews work because they are one-on-one -on -one trust building experiences between direct supervisors and employees. Here's another way to think about this. You recall the slide where the green were engaged, the middle, the charcoal group, was not engaged, the far right, the sabotagers in orange, were disengaged. Gallup went out and said in a sample, my manager and I have one of the strongest personal relationships in my life. It's a strong sentence. And for the engaged group, 16% scored at a five on a five scale. 16% scored at a four on a five scale. 33% scored at a three on a five scale. So 65% that that's at least the three out of five, that my manager and I have one of the strongest personal relationships in my life. But the sabotagers, 80% scored at a one, 1% scored at a five. So without question, there is a strong correlation between how hard people work, how engaged they are in their relationship with their supervisors. This is undeniable data. It's undeniable data. Now, let's dig one step further, and instead of start talking about responsibilities and goals, let's talk about accountabilities. So here we have healthcare, group of hospitals had high nurse turnover, as so many of them do, and all of the hospitals but one said, we know how to fix this. We're going to have two new programs that are better than the other program, which are on-site on -site child care and flexible scheduling. But the outlier said, nope, we're done with programs. All we're going to do is say to our managers, you are accountable. There is a report every month with your name on it. You are accountable for retaining your team and your talent. One year later, that hospital saw nurse turnover go down 41%, saved millions of dollars. As importantly, the other hospitals in the comparison study that did on-site child care and flexible scheduling saw zero change at all. So you can't miss this point, that if you want to improve retention and engagement, you have to do it through your managers and stop going around them, because they are the secret sauce. They are the ones who can make this change. So the question becomes, which side matters more? Everything you give them, pay benefits, bonuses, employee appreciation, we employ the month, brown bag lunches, et cetera, et cetera, everything you give them, or give them a supervisor they trust. And every time I speak to a group in person, which I do a lot, I say, think about your company, raise your hand if you can think of at least one person who manages people who cannot build trust with their teams. Everybody, of course, raises their hands, and it makes me say, well, stop doing exit surveys, engagement surveys, Go deal with this problem because trust is the deal, and I'm going to show you exactly why I say that. So good programs, good supervisors, you win. Good programs, bad supervisors, you lose. Why do you lose? Because a jerk boss will trump any goodness you do in your company. Any goodness, a jerk boss will trump it. So let's talk about the T word, trust. Now I want to start by asking all of you to think about the best boss you ever had. And of course, this is not a great boss here, but what made your best boss the best boss? What were the things your best boss did that when you think of them, you smile and you say, yeah, that was the best boss I ever had. And if you're in a room with your current boss, this is a great suck up opportunity. <laughs> Give him a little wink. But seriously, what did your best boss do to become your best boss? And likewise, what did your worst boss do to become your worst boss? And as you think about this mini exercise, 
I'm going to throw out a theory, all right? I'm going to throw out two ideas that uh, I'll bet you 20 bucks are true. So 20 bucks times everybody who's on this broadcast today. So the first of this, these ideas is you trusted your best boss. Your best boss did things that build trust. You distrusted your worst boss. Your worst boss took credit for things, didn't tell you the truth, sabotaged you, did all those things bad bosses do. So you trust the best, you distrusted the worst. The second thing I would tell you is that the best boss you ever had had shortcomings. And because you trusted this person, you were so forgiving of their shortcomings, the things they couldn't get right, it's almost like they were cute when they made a mistake. Because you trusted them, and trust conquers all. But your worst boss, who you didn't trust, had strength. They had things they could do well. That's why they were in that job. But you didn't care because nothing was good in your eyes about them because you didn't trust them. Because breaking trust is the ultimate in relationship killers. And I'm a therapist by training, and I can tell you human relationships have been primarily on just two variables, trust and self-esteem. You stick with people who are looking out for you, and you stick with people who make you feel good about being you. And if we could put that chip in every manager's head, we would win, but of course, we're not allowed to drill into their heads. But also, work is a rat's nest for building trust because there's so much stress to get things done. There's competition for resources, for promotions, and other things. It's just not an easy place to build trust. But we have to become great trust builders in order to improve engagement and retention. If we had a magic solution, if we said, go to put everybody through this course, you know, it really doesn't work. It's giving them a process, a tool for which to build trust that's one-on-one -on -one and personal, which, of course, is the subject of our webinar today. So I want to tell you a story. The story will blow your mind. The story is about Fortune magazine. Fortune magazine names the top 100 companies to work for every year. These have to be big companies. And there's a lot of competition to get on this list. And Google has won. They've been number one the last four years. And they've been number one six of the 17 years. So Google is without question the best place to work in the United States, according to Fortune magazine. So if you ever looked at one of these special issues, there are foldouts where you read about all 100 companies and the things they give employees. They get special icons if they do one or more things well. 5% or below turnover, top 5% or better in pay, domestic partner benefits, or a fitness center. Why Fortune threw the dart at those four, I'm not sure, but you get special notification if you do one of those four things. And there are feature articles on all the great things that companies, and here's the key phrase, give employees. So let's take Google. When they won the last time, last year, sixth year at number one, bolstered parental leave benefits, new parents, regardless of gender, get up to 12 weeks fully paid baby bonding time, also give baby bonding bucks. Two years ago, what did Google do so well? Well, the feature there was they donate $50 for employees, for time employees volunteer, and they send employees to Ghana and India. So if your company does not send employees to Ghana and India, You'll never be a great place to work, it appears. We go back three years, and now we have a woman coming down a slide who I guarantee you is an actress, and any good HR person would say, workers comp, workers comp. But apparently we need to have a slide. So the internet juggernaut takes the best company's crown for the fourth time, not just for the 100,000 hours of massages. New this year, three wellness centers, seven acre sports complex, roller hockey rink, basketball, bocce, soccer ball, and horseshoe pits. So if you don't have horseshoe pits, you will never be a great company. But now we go back four years and say we're playing ping pong and foosball. Employees rave about their mission, the culture, famous perks of the Plex. Bocce courts, a bowling alley, alley, eyebrow shaping, 25 cafes all gratis. So not just free food, it's free eyebrow shaping. So I'm sure some of you out there, and especially us guys, need our eyebrow shaped. So I'm mocking this. Why am I mocking this? Because every year, when I buy my special edition, I go to the end of the special section, and I get out a magnifying glass, and I read the fine print. And the fine print says, 
two-thirds of a company's scores based on the results of the Great Place to Work's Trust Index Survey. And I say two things. Two-thirds, that's like more than half. And what is this Trust Index Survey? So we go to the website of the Great Place to Work Institute. It says any company can be a great place to work. Our approach is based on the major findings of 20 years of research. Trust between managers and employees is the primary defining characteristic of the very best workplaces. Wow. So notice what it says, trust between managers and employees, not executives and employees, not companies and employees, but your manager and you, that that is according to Great Place to Work Institute, what drives great companies. Okay, so what do I know so far? I know horseshoe pits and eyebrow shaping are nice, but all together, all those things comprise one third of the score. But the driving force here is what? It is trust between managers and employees. So we continue digging, and now we find that for the 17 years of the top 100 award, that every year Fortune magazine pits the publicly traded companies that make the top 100, so we know what their shareholder returns are against the market for the year, and on average those companies provide 366% more shareholder returns, more profit than the other companies. So the only thing you can conclude, the only thing, is companies, big and small, where employees trust their immediate supervisor, have greater productivity, make more money, do everything better. That's what you can conclude. So it's not just that supervisors drive retention and engagement, it's the skill they need to drive it is to build trust. Pretty cool, huh? So to continue this trend, we now know Google has great supervisors. They did an internal study to tell us what their supervisors do. And what they said was technical expertise, the ability, say, to write computer code in your sleep, ranked last among the eight criteria they studied. The top three were even-keeled bosses who made time for one-on-one -on -one meetings, who helped people puzzle through problems by asking questions, not to take answers, who took an interest in employees' lives and careers. I'm going to tell you now, this is what stay interviews are. We've gotten there. This is what they are. Because it's one-on-one -on -one meetings, even keeled, even keeled meaning doesn't freak out, is open to my ideas, help people puzzle through their own problems, not telling them what to do, and thirdly, took an interest in employees' lives and careers. Now, if we just pause and say, what does this mean, interest in employees' lives and careers? <coughs> we would probably say, well, that's vanilla ice cream. Everybody knows about that. That's easy to understand. I don't think it is. I think, I'll make another bet here, that if we, if your CEO said to you, great news, go take all your employees out one-on-one -on -one for dinner, and I'll pay for it so you get to know them better and take an interest in their lives and careers, that you would say, okay, good idea, I think, go out about three times with three employees, then come to your manager and say, you know, I'm going to do the rest as a group. We'll have, we'll have appetizers, we'll have desserts, we'll have a great dinner, we'll laugh, but it's taking too much time, I'll take the rest as a group. And I think you would say it because you only like three of them. I think that for the most part, it's not so easy to take an interest in every single employee's life and career because we just like some of them more than others. We're more attracted to some of them more than others because they are human and so are we. But you know our companies run our behaviors. We better be really good, really good at taking interest in their lives and in their careers. So. Back to where we started. What's the big lesson? It's not what you give them, it's how you treat them. And first-line supervisors have the most influence on employees' relationships with the big three. The relationship with their manager, the relationship with their colleagues, how much they like what they do. That's the big three. So things happen at the bottom of the organization, not at the top, and that's why standards are so effective. And of course, the reason I put Einstein here in the quote is because Companies don't get it. They keep doing the same things over and over. They do employee surveys. They do exit surveys. They say, here's the list of what people want. How do we go give them the things? That's not how you do it. You go through the supervisor to get trust, and then you can learn not just how to retain and engage people, but you can increase their acceptance for things they can't have. 
So back to our definition, you remember it, structured discussion, the leader conducts with each individual employee for an action she must take to strengthen that employee's engagement and retention. And let's take this a step further now and say, does it work? So I put here three examples, all right, call centers immediately down 20%, hospital all turnover down 37%, nurse turnover down 70% in the first year, retirement community nurse turnover down 70%, set a secondary goal that 90% of new nurses would get to 180 days, haven't lost one cent. The only difference in these companies is they did stay interviews. So how does this work? Notice the title of this slide says stay interview process key ingredients because it's not a one-time thing. It's putting this into place in a way that makes sense. So we would say, first of all, always done by direct supervisors, never by anybody else. Sometimes HR will say, well, we do a focus group of employees at 90 days and we bring cookies. Save the cookies. This, the trust has to be built with the supervisor and nobody else. The meeting has to be separate from a performance review. It cannot be tacked on. It can't be, well, we have them in a room. We can't have any more meetings. So we're going to do this at the end of the performance review. No, the moods are all. It's just not where you want to have employees really be open with you about how they like what they're doing and how it could be improved. It's not going to work. How often, at least one time with continuing employees, two times with new hires, because if you can stop new hire turnover, you'll slow all turnover. And for every job, there is a tipping point that says, based on history, if we keep somebody this long, they tend to stay a long time. So you want to get two stay interviews done within that tipping point with new hires. So we could offer you scripted openings, questions I'll show you, probes, closing, then it says create individual action plans one-on-one. -on -one. Stay action plans. Here's what I can do for you because, yeah, we can fix this thing. You're right. That is a problem. Then it says on the bottom, manager's forecast retention. I'll get to the forecast in a minute. But I want to tell you a story. And the story is we've worked with hundreds and hundreds, well, thousands of managers to do stay interviews. And recently I surveyed a large group of them. And I asked them many questions. But I had a great interest in one. And the one I had a great interest in was, what is it that employees ask for the most? What's the thing they bring up that's most important? And I know many of us would say, oh, this sounds like a bad idea. Because they're all going to want promotions. They're all going to want raises. They're all going to want things we can't give them. The thing that employees brought up the most was better work processes. Fix this equipment. Stop having me do this report that nobody reads. Get this department to get their work done on time because they make me late. It's things about work that were the dominant things employees brought up because they want to be more productive and they don't want to come to work and be frustrated. So for you to think about, that's what people ask about the most. So here's five questions, top five, only five. What do you look forward to each day when you commute to work? We start with that question because it is both positive and it gets the employee thinking locally. What do you think about when you commute to work? Now, when we train managers, we tell them some of, the, some of your employees will say, I look forward to lunch and going home. And you should say, I have those days too. But really, what things do you look forward to? Let's find out what's magic for you. Secondly, what are you learning here and what do you want to learn? So this discussion with good probing, tell me more, help me understand what's really important to you, how important is that to you, where have you seen those skills, where have you seen somebody do this job, what about that job is so appealing, probe, 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 this is how we morph into career discussions, but it's also true that some employees will say, I don't want to learn nothing, I'm happy, leave me alone, so leave them alone, because not everybody needs a development plan. But for most employees, the things they want to learn, somebody in your company can teach them. This is not make sure we know the tuition reimbursement policy, although in a few cases maybe you do, but every everybody in your company is a teacher. The third question says, why do you stay here? Wow, there's no eye contact, right? Well, I never thought about it. Why do I stay here? And the best probe is to say, 
Think about it. You could leave. You've worked here a long time. I'm so glad you don't leave. But why is it you keep coming back? What is it that every day is so appealing to you? Learn the answer to that, and you have a piece of gold, because retention is about learning why people stay and building on it. So it could be colleagues, and oftentimes it is. It could be the responsibilities. It could be working with patients or working with customers. What is the magic about staying here that's so important? Fourth question says, what could cause you to leave us? When's the last time you thought about leaving? Leaving? What prompted it? Yes, I want to know. On a 1 to 10 scale, is this still important to you? What's the single best thing I can do to improve this? Some people might say, I don't know. Do you really want to stir that pot? And they're probably the same ones who don't talk to their teenagers about sex because they think the teenagers won't think about it if they don't. The fifth one says, what can I do as your manager to make your job better for you? So what do I do too much of too little of? Do I tell you what you do well? Am I, do I tell you too often what you don't do well? Do I micromanage you? Am I not present enough? Tell me how to form me to be the best manager for you. Those questions with the best probes will get you everywhere you want to go. After I began writing the books, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there were many uh, companies, big and small, uh, consulting companies, bloggers, that jumped on the train and said, here's 30 questions. Pick the best ones. Nope, don't pick the best ones from 30. Ask these five. Ask probes with these five, and I can guarantee you, based on our research, you will get all the information you need. If two things happen, you probe well, and they trust you. Of course, if they don't trust you, you're going to have to do an even better job so they trust you more the next time. So here is the magic. The title says Retention Forecast Heat Map, a very large company that makes video games named at that, who's a client of ours. So imagine now if after every stay interview, the manager had to forecast how long that employee will stay. So in this case, we have a leader whose name is Rodriguez has four direct reports, Kim Johnson, Burt Brown, Cindy Stone, Ralph Jimenez. We've imported performance ratings, pretty easy for most companies to do, into either a page on their HRIS system or an Excel spreadsheet. So we know Kim Johnson's pretty good. She's a four out of five. Burt's really good. Cindy's so-so. Ralph's not so good. <clears throat> so after Rodriguez's stay interviews, Rodriguez went into the system and said for Kim Johnson, if you move your eye to the far right, you know, we talked, and Kim wants to learn more. I'm going to sign a mentor for her. We have a plan for how often they will meet. Kim will get back to me and tell me how the training goes. I think she'll be here in a year. I'm clicking green. Bert, uh-oh, <clears throat> top performer. I'm clicking red. Bert's going to be gone in six months because Bert said, you know what? Headhunters call me every day. I am so tired of doing all this work. I want to be a manager, and either you make me a manager or I'm taking a headhunter call. Well, we built a plan to build skills for Bert to promote Bert, but we don't know if Bert can really do this. We don't know if he's going to learn the skills. So the jury's out on our side whether we can promote him. The jury's out on his side. He's right. He could be leaving in six months. We're doing the best we can. Cindy, pleased with current role and circumstance. She'll be here in a year. Ralph, not so good for performance. We've got him yellow, which means he'll be gone in six to 12 months. But you know, pretty soon he's going to move to red if he doesn't get better, or if he gets better, and B, if we think he wants to stay, we'll slide him over to green. So in our, with our clients, they can change colors. The manager can change colors any day they want, but they are accountable for their colors. Now, we all know some people quit, and you can do nothing about it. You didn't see it coming. Their mom has cancer. They have to move a 1,000 miles away. Can't do anything about it. But the forecasting is not designed to be accurate. It's designed to further motivate the managers to conduct effective stay interviews and to make their goals. So one of the outcomes of the heat map is that a manager will go to their manager and say, I have a goal to cut turnover. I've done stay interviews. Bert Brown, who you know is my best performer, I've got Bert as red because of this circumstance I told you about before, about wanting to be promoted and getting headhunter calls. I'm doing everything I can do. If you've got a better idea, you tell me. Because if he leaves, I want to lose him. But I've done the best I can do. So key issues get surfaced up. Another thing that happens is, 
that you would say as a manager, you would go to your manager and say, uh, make up a name. David is a top performer. David has a request. He would like this policy or this process to change. I don't have the authority to do it. You have the authority. For people above you have the authority. This is a reasonable request. I've got David down as yellow. I don't think he's going to last another year if we don't fix this thing, but I can't fix it. Will you fix it for me? Because I've done everything I can do. And this is another way of saying a phrase we all know what it means, sacred cows. It is there are things in organizations that persist over decades that nobody will fix, but employees will tell you to fix them. And when you say to a manager, you're accountable, you have a goal, we're counting on you, You've got to do stay interviews, build stay plans, forecast. They will tell you where the sacred cows are, and you need to know. Because just like civilization, just like government, change happens from the bottom up, not the top down. Always from the bottom up. This is how company culture changes to make companies more effective at engagement and retention. Through supervisors, certainly not through surveys, and bringing the real change that employees want that is reasonable. If you can't say yes to something, you say no, and here's why, you're better off to know if that's really important to the employee, you make them yellow or red, and you say, I've done everything I can, I can't fix this thing. I don't think as a company we can fix this thing. But just asking the five questions buys you so much trust and faith. So starting to summarize here, Business Week said that this work we're talking about is fresh thinking for solving the turnover problem in any economy. The reason they said it is because what have we talked about? We're going to convert everything to dollars. We're not going to talk about benchmarks. It's not going to be our turnover is 32%, the benchmark's 33, high five me, because that just means you're one hair better than what? Mediocre. We don't want to be one hair better than mediocre. In my company, in C-Suite Analytics, we are so disinterested in benchmarks. We don't care. The only benchmark is your data. Keep improving your own data. So we convert everything to dollars, turnover, engagement, and I'll show you how to do that. We convert everything to goals. There are goals for engagement and goals for retention. They're at the first line supervisor level. Those supervisors become trained to do stay interviews and implement them with their teams and build stay plans. Those leaders forecast how long employees will stay. We also can forecast how many employees move into the green on engagement, and those leaders become accountable for their goals and their forecast. Excuse me, I jumped ahead. For their goals and their forecast. Now, if you have ever worked in a company where sales is important, this is exactly the way companies do sales. They know if you sell 5,000 widgets, how many dollars that means in everybody's pocket. Nobody has to get out a calculator. Everybody knows versus the ambiguity of an engagement score and a turnover percent. They have goals for sales, they have tools they use, they forecast their sales, they're accountable for their goals and for their forecast. So all we've done is to make a business-driven model instead of a traditional HR-driven model. And I'm a recovering HR person, I get it, but the way to do this is with business-driven tools. This is the business-driven set of tools right on your slide. So I want to ask you a final question, then I'll be glad to take your questions. This is the fun part. So the Gallup organization is surveying citizens of the world, over 150 nations. And the question they're asking is, what will bring you the most happy, what brings you the most happiness? They're doing this survey every year for a hundred years. A hundred years. And in a book by Jim Clifton, who's the Gallup CEO, I came across on page 11 the answer after six years as to what is the biggest driver of happiness in the world. And the answer is one of these five choices. So let's put happiness into perspective. Happiness is all there is. It's all there is. And one way to think about it is one of my heroes in life is Abraham Lincoln. And a few years ago, I did the all-in Lincoln. I read everything. I studied everything. I went to Springfield, Illinois, and I saw his home and his furniture. I saw photographs of him playing with his kids on the lawn. I went to his office. I saw documents he had signed. I did the whole Lincoln thing. And uh, it was fascinating. It's a fascinating little chunk of my life. And 
as much as I regard Lincoln so highly, he was clinically depressed. He married the wrong woman who ended up in an asylum. He watched two of his children die. He watched 10,000 soldiers die. Of course, he got shot and killed, but he didn't know that. But by every account, he was depressed. Now, he's on the penny. He's on Mount Rushmore. But you would not trade your life for the life Lincoln had. Bad trade. You would not want Lincoln's life because everything is about happiness. So five answers here. I'm going to read them. I'm going to we're going to do a poll where you all choose what you think the right answer is, and then I'm going to disclose the right answer. So, is the key to health, is the key to happiness, good health? Is it a good job? Is it love and respect from others? Is it money for needs and more? Or is it better life for your children? So, let's do the poll and ask people to vote one, just one, of these five. Okay, 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, can we see the results? 25% for good health, 15% for a good job. The winner, according to the group, is love and respect from others. Nobody picked money, 15% picked better life for your children. So. Since no one chose money, we'll assume every all of you on this webcast have a soul, right? <laughs> and if you pick better life for your children, I will tell you that's not the right answer, but the origin of it is that when I worked for the CIA, that I learned, I used to ask my spy friends, how do you get people to tell you secrets? How much money do you spend to get secrets? And they told me over and over, it's about identifying people who know what you want to know, building trust with them, and making them believe you can make their government and their country better for themselves or their children. And when I said, how much money do you pay them? They said the best thing we give is a college education in the U.S. for their children. So much focus on better life for your children, but it's not the right answer. The correct answer is, drum roll, drum roll again. A good job. And it blew my mind when I read it in this book on page 11. But as I thought about it, it made sense to me because we greatly underestimate how important our job is in our lives. We know it's important, but it is what we build our lives around, most of us, not our families, around our jobs. It's where we build our adult relationships for the most part. It is where we get our day-to-day -day wins and losses and our self-esteem. This is a huge part of work. And the reason I put it here at the end is because I think many of us are inclined to think that our job is really important to us, but maybe not as important to others or as important to people on our teams or as important to my colleagues. But the fact is, it's a big deal to everybody. We just have to figure out a way to make it better. And we've done a lousy job when turnover is out of control and engagement hasn't budged in 15 years, well, then we know we're doing the wrong things. So I offer you this idea of stay interviews along with accountability and forecasting. Those are the key pieces. And so, uh, so I offer this idea to you and will tell you it's not a good idea. It is the good idea. It's by far the best one I know. So before I take questions, let me tell you if you would like to have a white paper on how to cost turnover and engagement or engagement correlations to productivity, the finance people love, or a training game for stay interviews, send me an email. Tell me how many employees you have for sure. I have to know that. And we'll be glad to send you this information. One other thought, too, is if this is the kind of information you think is helpful and these solutions are helpful, we offer a Certified Employee Retention Professional Program, CERP, Certified Employee Retention Professional Program, where we certify employees through a series of steps they take with their companies to improve engagement and retention. And should you be certified by SHRM or HRCI, they give 26 credits for this program 
the last three people in this program, sounds like I'm exaggerating here, cut turnover 41%, 46%, and 88%. The cost to get in is 1000 bucks. The ROI is incredible. It's my favorite program. I work personally with everybody in this program. So if you'd like to know about the certification program, put that in your email too. So free stuff should you want it to learn more about the certification program too. And I will now turn the floor back and I think I'll turn it back to you, Allison, to see if you or anyone else have questions, and I'll be glad to answer them. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. A really, really great presentation. I'm always um, amazed every time I see some of the information in there in terms of um, how effective uh, a really change can be in terms of moving from the programs to accountability. Um, I do have a question. Uh, Mariah is is monitoring the lines now. If anybody else has questions, please type them into the chat or Q&A boxes. Uh, but for now, I'd love to hear from you, Dick, about um, what you would say are the number one um, challenges or roadblocks to organizations who are starting to make this transition into more accountabilities-driven um, retention. Well, you know, one roadblock is they have to leaders have to know everybody's in the same game that their boss is accountable for keeping them too. Another one is that they want to be sure that if they lose somebody that's not within their control that that's not held against them. And a third one that we all want to make sure is that they still fire people who need to be fired. So those are three obstacles that when we work with our, with our client companies we really have any difficulty getting through those three. Great, very helpful. Um, I'm glad your information is up here in case people want to start talking through some more of those roadblocks or get more information on this. Um, Mariah, I don't think we have any other questions on the line right now. Um, so uh, for now, I guess we'll just say thank you so much, Dick. Um, for everybody that's listening, thank you for joining us. You, again, can, can reach out to Dick directly. If you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to us here at the STAR Center. Um, and uh, copies of this recording and these handouts will be available very shortly on our website at chcworkforce.org. Um, so if no other questions are pouring in right now, Oh, there is one question. Um, uh, Dick, can you let us know if there's any cost to obtain some of these original materials? Um, so engagement correlations to productivity and the SAY interview manager and the training game. Is that all available in your book? Uh, we can even make it easier. Send me an email. We'll send you all these things. There's no cost at all. Love that. Can't get better than that, folks. You heard it here today. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dick, for that answer and uh, for your presentation today. We really appreciate your time and all your expertise, and uh, we're certain we'll be working with you again for other Star Center activities. So thanks so much uh, to you and to everybody else. Okay. Thank you all. I hope you, above all else, found this to be helpful. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.